All right, welcome everyone to the Huri Institute for Computing. Welcome virtually to us, of course. Um, I'm delighted to uh, be able to uh, get started here with our Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, this is a cluster of speakers on machine learning for model-rich problems. Um, we're going to be listening to Miguel Besa today talk about uh, machine learning advances in mechanics and materials. So I'm Eric Kolachuk. I'm director of the Hurry Institute. Uh, program from today is a brief welcome from me, then I'm going to turn it over to Emma Lejeune, who is uh, one of the junior faculty fellows in our institute, and she's going to introduce our speaker. Uh, we'll have a little over a half hour talk by our speaker, and then we like to leave plenty of time for Q&A. I want to have one important administrative housekeeping question. Of course, uh, if you're used to Zoom, this is uh, fairly standard now for you. We encourage you, please, to use the Q&A feature to enter your questions. We will be gathering those together, and then we'll be using those to direct the Q&A uh, at the end there. So quick word about who we are, if you haven't heard about us. So the Hurry Institute for Computing here at Boston University is dedicated to initiating research convergence and accelerating integrated initiatives uh, with a particular eye towards social impact at the nexus of computational and data sciences. Uh, the Institute includes as well a number of centers and initiatives that are our core anchor tenants, if you will. Uh, they work in collaboration to advance this ambitious research portfolio you see we have folks from everywhere from AI research to digital health to cyber alliance. The work that comes out of the Institute uh, has a similarly broad array ranging from work on misinformation to cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, uh, cloud computing, conservation, and more. Uh, this series in particular is a distinguished speaker series that's aiming to bring innovative speakers with bold ideas and computing enabled and data driven areas of research here to Boston University. Uh, the series hosts a handful of speakers clustered around a theme over a roughly two to three week period. And uh, we have each speaker not only come and speak independently, but then they come and rejoin us for a panel discussion at the end. So we heard from Cecilia Clementi last week we have Miguel Besa today, and we look forward as well to welcoming Jacob Bortnick and Joshua Blumenstick in the near future. And then all of them will come together uh, on a single panel. So I'm gonna introduce today's host, uh, and then I'll turn it over to her. So uh, Alain Jean is a assistant professor of mechanical engineering here at BU. Her background is in the area of computational mechanics and computational biomechanics, with research focusing on leveraging state-of-the-art and computational mechanics to investigate multi-scale emergent behavior in biological systems and to inform patient-specific medical protocols. Her current area is a research involved integrating data-driven and physics-based computational models and predicting the mechanical behavior of highly heterogeneous soft tissue. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Emma. It's all yours. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, today, we're delighted to host uh, Miguel Besa. Miguel is an associate professor as of um, March in the Material Science and Engineering Department at Delft University of Technology and the director of the interfaculty AI lab called Machina. Notably, he was awarded the prestigious Veni Personal Grant from the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research in 2019. Miguel received his PhD in mechanical engineering from Northwestern University as a Fulbright Scholar in 2016, and was a postdoctoral scholar in aerospace at the California Institute of Technology until 2017. His research involves understanding and modeling materials at different scales in a new experimentally validated and self-consistent computational framework. And he envisions a new era of design of materials and structures through machine learning. And I'm very much looking forward to his talk. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Emma and Eric. So I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully you are seeing my slides at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Eric. Well, thanks again for the very kind introduction. It's really, it's, it's really a pleasure for me to be here today and, and deliver this talk. I know that this is uh, uh, supposed to be a, a, a broad audience, 
and I will try to the best I can to 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 simplify things. And, and but if there are any questions, please do let me know. So today we're going to talk about machine learning advances in mechanics of materials. And uh, in fact, we, we are going to focus on, on a single question, really, that uh, my, my group has been focusing on for, for a couple of years, which is how can we accelerate the analysis and design of materials and structures? This is, this is really what has kept us busy in the last uh, few years. And uh, our answer to this is uh, um, uh, a data-driven framework to, to try to design or analyze these materials and structures. And uh, of course, uh, the, the, the general workflow of data-driven science was not invented by us. Um, but uh, if you want to apply this to materials and structures, then it goes like this. So basically, you have to define your inputs that we call design of experiments. And if you are taking care of a material, if you want to analyze or design a material, typically what the variables you can define are the microstructure, and you can have microstructure descriptors for these, these uh, phases. You can have the properties of the materials changing. For example, if you have this kind of material that is reinforced by particles that are shown in red, then you can also choose what's the material phase in red and also what's the material phase in, in white, for example. And you want to subject the material to different boundary conditions, different external conditions. Well, it could be a deformation, it could be temperature, it could be any sort of, of loading condition. And this basically defines the, the knobs, if you will, that we can turn to design or to analyze a different class of, of materials. Then what we do is you sample this design space and uh, uh, you basically, for each of these uh, uh, input variables, you can sample one particular case and you could do uh, computational analysis, predictions, models that predict the behavior of this particular combination of microstructure, properties and boundary conditions. And if you, if you do this for uh, enough uh, uh, of these samples, what you can do is you can create a response database. I also should point out that it doesn't need to be from computational analysis. You could obtain this database with experiments. You could even collect experiments from different parts of the world in, in the same database. Or it could also be uh, obtained from analytical calculations. But the point is that you, you have to obtain this, this database and once you have this data with the outputs, for example, if you're interested in the stiffness of the material or a particular plastic behavior, such as the yield point or something, you collect that output, that, that property of interest, and then you can use machine learning to find the relationship between these inputs and these outputs. Now, uh, when you do uh, use machine learning, you obtain a new model. And these models can be for regression, for classification, clustering. There's all kinds of, of problems that you can solve. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this in a very abstract manner. And if you have this new model, you could even uh, couple uh, optimization algorithms to come up with a new design. We will focus more on the machine learning part of the talk today, but this is the general workflow that you, you, you'd have to, to go about. So how does this work? Let's start with a simple example where you have these composite materials um, where you, you would have, for example, uh, a matrix that could be a polymer, a rubber, and uh, some particles that uh, could be elliptical. And as we discussed before, what you would do is you would define a set of microstructure descriptors. In this particular case, it could be the volume fraction of the material. So how much of one phase there is as compared to the other one. So 2% would be you know, a few of these elliptical particles, 45, it would be a lot more. And you can have more descriptors. You can say that the number of particles, because you can have a different number of particles for the same volume fraction. The aspect ratio, do you want circles or do you want uh, uh, ellipses? Um, and the mean and nearest distances between the, the, these ellipses. Then you define your property descriptors. In this case, we are keeping them constant. So it's the same material for the, the ellipses that comes from an Aruda-Boyce hyperelastic model, if you're familiar with it. 
or uh, and the uh, new Hookin hyperelastic model for for the particles, right? So one for the matrix, another for the particles, and we say, okay, we are not changing the phases in this particular problem. And you would subject this material to different boundary conditions. You would displace this material uh, domain that we call a representative volume element to different boundary conditions. And the question is, can we learn how the material behaves? If we deform it in some manner, can we determine what would be the stress, what would be the forces that would uh, counteract this deformation? So how do we do this? As I mentioned, first you do sampling or design of experiments. You choose a, a size of your sampling, uh, 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 let's say in this case over 10,000 uh, uh, points, sorry. And then you sample these, these descriptors that we discussed before uh, to, to obtain um, the, the, the different designs, right? And each of these points, in this case, I'm, I'm showing a lot of, of, of sampling points, but we don't need to have that many would correspond to a particular design uh, over there. Once you did the sampling, you have to do a simulation for each point that you're doing the sampling. And in this case, it was about half a terabyte of data. And you do one by one these, these different simulations, different boundary conditions, different microstructures uh, uh, under different uh, uh, loading conditions, like I mentioned. Once you have the data, you can use machine learning. And for example, you can use the most popular uh, technique at the moment, which are artificial neural networks, but you could use something else like Gaussian processes as well. Now, long story short, once you have uh, a machine learning model, there are a few things that you can do. First, you can calculate uh, just simply the sensitivity of the, the, the uh, outputs to a certain input. What does this mean? So in this case, all these seven descriptors that we, that we described before, this is showing that actually the volume fraction and the strain components in the one direction and the two direction are the most important, the ones that cause the biggest variation at the output. And in this particular case, actually most of the other descriptors could have been neglected or at least they have a small uh, impact on the property. Which means that later on, you could actually reduce the size of, of your input space and, and do uh, uh, find the, the behavior of the material with fewer descriptors. And as usual, you can also plot what is the evolution of the error uh, as you uh, refine the, the design space. So if you have more and more uh, uh, input points, your error of your approximation for the material behavior keeps going down. And, you know, long story short, what happens is as follows. If you tell me, well, Miguel, I have this composite material with these rubber phases. Um, you know, there's this class of materials that have many different geometries. I can have many different reinforcements that I put there. Can you tell me what is the behavior of these materials, not just of one particular material, but the full class that, that we discussed here? And the answer is yes, actually, in, in, in a quite accurate manner, we can obtain the, the hyperelastic potential and the stress strain curves that, that uh, can be derived from that. Okay. All right. So um, the big question now is does this work for every problem in mechanics? Because we were talking about the problem that involved hyperelasticity and it was very, very simple to compute, very easy and fast. And the truth is that in theory, you can use this, this workflow, this data-driven framework to, to, to many, to a large class of, of, of mechanics problems. Unfortunately, however, there are important challenges. And I'm gonna to talk to you about three challenges and, and our solutions to deal with them so that we could tackle uh, more uh, um, difficult problems in, in mechanics of materials. So the challenges are in red, and the solutions are in, in green. And I would like to first start with data scarcity and, and our solution, which was a new method that we proposed. So this first challenge is probably something that we encountered, uh, many of us have encountered in, in their lives before, which is that if we want to predict the behavior of a material or a structure or actually many other things, we know one thing. If we want to be accurate, we also usually are very computationally expensive, 
These are costly simulations. For example, if you simulate the material at a atomistic scale, like this epoxy, it can take about one day of computation in a supercomputer. If you do a micro scale simulation of a representative volume element, in this particular case, it took about five days to compute. Just one design, one particular case under one loading condition. And even at the macro scale, if you consider plasticity or fracture, these are simulations that easily take six hours, if not more, as well. So at different scales, you face oftentimes the problem that realistic uh, problems that we want to tackle also take a very long time to compute. And the problem is that if you actually then want to sample the design space so that you can use machine learning, because you do need quite a bit of data most of the time, you're faced with the fact that you cannot create the big enough data to use these techniques. Now, uh, I'm going to keep it very short, but basically uh, a few years ago, uh, Zillian Liu and myself, uh, advised by my PhD advisor at the time, Wing Kam Liu, we created a method called self-consistent clustering analysis that basically takes these representative volume elements and based on a clustering technique, finds the points that are behaving similarly mechanically and reduces the space from, you know, millions or hundreds of thousands of finite elements to a few material clusters. For example, here you see only 16 material clusters. So the same color, the same yellow would be the same material cluster. But now, as you can imagine, if the material paints the temperature, it will be the same temperature at every point where you have yellow. And it will be a different point, a different temperature in the places where you see blue. So it's much faster to compute the behavior of this material. Then we solve this, this uh, uh, clustered representative volume element based on a, a quantum mechanical equation uh, called the lippmann schwinger equation. And the details of this particular solution I'm going to skip, but I, I welcome you to ask questions if, you, if you'd like at the end of the talk. So the important point that I would like to, to convey is that we take simulations, plasticity simulations that take about one day in a supercomputer to a few seconds, five seconds to four minutes in, in a, a MATLAB code that now actually is a Python code in my group, which is a massive reduction of, of, of simulation time. So this helps because this or another reduced order model that you would like to use uh, 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 speed up the simulations and allow us to create enough data so that we can actually use machine learning. And that's what we did uh, shortly after the method came out. We applied it to these three-dimensional composites and predicted the plasticity behavior and asked the question, could we predict what is the combination of phases that would lead to the higher toughness of the material? Toughness is just the area below the stress strain curve. So we're trying to maximize this area. And using the SCA, each of these points would be a few minutes to compute as compared to one day in, with several processors in, in, the, in the supercomputer. And we find out, found out that this particular combination of, of properties could maximize toughness to 12 millijoule per millimeter cubed. And we believe this was the first time that it was done in plasticity. Okay, but this is not the entire story. There's other problems as well involved in, in this. And one very big problem is the history or time dependency, dependency of the material properties. And what, I, what do I mean by that? Well, if you take a material and you start deforming the material, uh, so I'm following the line uh, one, so you're applying tension to this material, and then you stop and you start applying shear and you compress the material. So now I'm following the line two, and then you stop again at some point and you go back to the origin. So it would be zero strain, no deformation. If you have a, a material that has plasticity, what you will see is that the stress, the force per unit area, evolves, but does not go back to the original point because there's history dependency. It's not the same thing to end up in a particular deformation state uh, uh, because it depends on the history that it took you to get there. This is complicated because most machine learning algorithms do not deal, they, they make one-to-one -one mappings. They don't deal with the history uh, until you get to a particular state. 
So we, our, our method, SCA method, could, could, can predict this, this behavior. But the question is, can we actually learn this, this behavior with the machine learning? And this is actually a, a pretty interesting problem that has been uh, 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 invoked for, for a while. Introducing time and history dependency and plasticity is not easy if you want to do it with analytical models, as Rodney Hill pointed, points out in his beautiful book. But in fact, it's not that difficult for a deep learning technique called recurrent neural networks. What we showed is that actually you can deform these material domains, these representative volume elements with arbitrary paths. So you sample different paths. It's not just points of deformation, but full paths of deformation. And then the recurrent neural networks can actually learn the history dependency and predict plastic behavior for new paths that, was, that were not used in, in this story. I hope this is clear what we're doing as an input. So the input are these deformations, and we want to learn the stress, the force per unit area, as well as the plastic energy. Long story short, we tried a few different uh, recurrent neural network architectures. I have to credit my uh, uh, colleague, Mostad Mozafar, who has done a beautiful job in, in terms of comparing different architectures. And we proposed a particularly simple one that, that deals with the problem. It seems to be dealing with the problem quite well. And there were several papers uh, that came afterwards that followed a similar approach and proposed also different architectures. But the point was that, as you can see here, these are predictions. So if we impose these deformation paths for the, the strain in the 1, 1, 2, 2, and the shear, we see that actually, and the, the dashed line is the prediction is the, the, the test set that is not seen, the behavior that is not seen, and the solid line is the prediction for the from the neural networks. And you see that they predict the behavior quite well. And they do that for new loading conditions. For example, we didn't do a simple uniform loading and it predicts it very well, including the onset of plasticity. So over there, plasticity, then you start applying compression and it predicts all that very nicely. And it's interesting because it's known one of the giants in our field, Professor Michael Ortiz, a long time ago has already tried to motivate the need to develop models that are able to find what is called distortional hardening. This is the point where plasticity starts. And if you make, I'm gonna to go to the next slide. If you actually trace what is the initial, of, the initial plasticity, the initial point of plasticity called the yield point? Uh, 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 what you'll get, for example, would be an ellipse if you have these uh, von Mises models. But the interesting thing is that if you have a composite like this, actually this yield surface can dilate, rotate and distort. And these are very difficult things to predict with analytical models. There are some exceptions, but they are quite convoluted. But in this case, the recurrent neural network learns the distortion, the dilation, and the movement of the yield surface directly from the data. We did not impose any particular restriction. We did not say anything else. The plasticity starts there. The only thing we did was track the stresses and the plastic energy and the, the network predicts the, the distortion of the yield surface as well, and the hardening and softening behaviors as well. So uh, we did this for different classes of materials as well, not just one particular microstructure, and it was the same thing. So now you can have a model that predicts plasticity, so history dependency, also time dependent phenomena that have been modeled afterwards as well, and different microstructures and different material properties. So you can start building these models, these neural network, network models that include all of these complexities in, in one place. Okay, finally, I would like to talk to you about one last challenge that uh, we got us busy, which is the presence of imperfections and to design in the presence of imperfections for, the, for materials. So we had a very simple idea. The idea was as follows. I, I happen to know that in, in aerospace literature, there are satellite structures that are used to fold the satellite into a tight space. You send it to space and then it deploys. 
So it got me thinking if we could actually use this principle to create a metamaterial, 3D printed at a very small scale, but that had these units that were repeated in space. And if it was possible to design this under the restrictions of, of 3D printing that we had, basically obtaining a super compressible material. So you know the drill already. We have this framework and we have the design of experiments. And basically we have to define the descriptors, again, the variables that we need. In this particular case, the height of the cell, the diameters at the top of the bottom, the cross section of these elements that are called longerons and uh, the, the elastic properties of the material, okay? You do the sampling again, and you do the finite element simulations. The code does that automatically. And what do you want? What, what do you get? You have different designs and you get different stress strain curves again. So in this case, however, this is unstable. This is an unstable behavior that from buckling and post buckling. Buckling is just a bifurcation. So it's an instability that happens at some point where there's a rapid transition of, of, of state, in this case of deformation. And what we wanted to do was to see if we could actually print, 3D print this material having a large value for the buckling stress. So you first apply a large load and only then the material compresses and folds into this tight shape. So we track two things. We track the buckling stress, which is the, that star over there, and the energy below the curve, which is the toughness like we discussed before. And in this particular case, there's one challenge like I mentioned before, which is unstable behavior means that if you have a tiny imperfection, a tiny geometric imperfection, actually the stress strain curve changes dramatically. And in this particular case, the easiest mode of deformation is at the top. If there is this rotation at the top, that's the first buckling mode. So if you seed uh, this rotation angle as an imperfection that you sample from a log normal distribution, or if you measure experimentally, what happens is that if you do 1000 samplings of this different, uh, this imperfection in the geometry, you would get 1,000 different stress strain curves. This is what this is illustrating. This is the same design. But this is just illustrating the imperfection sensitivity. So now our properties are stochastic, meaning that they depend uh, on the, the imperfection that you have. Your property is not discrete, but actually follows a distribution. This is the distribution for one particular design of the energy absorbed, the toughness, if you will. Okay. I hope, I hope this is clear. So we have to be careful because now we have a property that is stochastic. We have a distribution for the output properties, but it turns out that there's a, a branch of machine learning that deals with this very effectively. It's called Bayesian machine learning. In this particular case, we use the method called sparse Gaussian processes that not only predict the average behavior the average property for the different designs, but they also predict the uncertainty associated to that property. So you can make a prediction of the average stress strain curve or the average property, but also how uncertain you are about the property you're predicting. And then we did basically the data-driven process first, came up with classification and regression maps. The yellow region says that these are the only designs that would actually be super compressible and not plastify or fracture. So they would be reversible. So we did all this. We find out that in this region, we have uh, uh, good properties of buckling and it, it is possible to have super compressibility. Then we did the prediction, we did the experiment, sorry. And the experiments actually agreed quite well with the predictions it made. So one of the first 3D printing, 3D prints that we made demonstrated the phenomena like we wanted to, as you'll see here. And I should add that this particular polymer we, we used breaks at about 4% strain. And yet you can compress this material to about to above 94%. So you compress it 94% using a material that would compress by 4% alone. And I think what's uh, interesting about this is that 
you're doing it in the inverse fashion. You first do machine learning and simulations, and then you do your, your validation with the experiments to see, you know, do, do I have an agreement? Is this really possible? I think it's interesting also to see that we actually miniaturize the design using a two photon nanolithography, uh, uh, nanoscribe uh, uh, 3D printer, and um, the design also worked. So we have here the different stress strain behavior. In this case, it was not fully reversible because of the hinges that we had, but it, it still survived. As you will see in a moment, these are real images of an optical microscope of the same uh, metamaterial. I'm gonna speed it up a little bit and you'll see that it is compressed and then survives and gets back. And these are the different cycles. First cycle, and then you know you do it again and again, and the material survives even though it accumulates some, some, some uh, plastic deformation. So I want to conclude and then talk to you a little bit about future work and the things that we're doing right now. I want to recall the question, the initial question, how can we accelerate structural material systems design? Well, we propose a general data-driven framework if you need to make the simulations faster to get the database, make sure that you look into reduced order modeling to speed up the simulations. We propose a method called SCA to do that for plasticity. If your uh, property is time dependent or history dependent, recurrent neural networks can be very helpful in that regard. And if you have imperfection sensitivity or a property that is stochastic, make sure that you look into Bayesian machine learning, which, because it could be very, very helpful. Now I can see that I still have three minutes, three and a half minutes left. So I wanted to give you a little teaser about the things that we're doing right now, uh, um, because there's still a ton of things to do in this field. We're really just scratching the surface, in my opinion. Although there are amazing people doing great work, like Emma, for example. So um, I teamed up with a brilliant colleague of mine called Richard Norton, and we have a postdoc co called Dong Gil Shin, who is very talented. So Richard is an expert in optomechanics. He, he does these uh, fantastic nanomechanical resonators that can be used to, to measure quantum energy and all sorts of other applications as well. I have to confess, this is not my expertise. I know, you know uh, some basics, but Richard, gave us a challenge. He told us that the name of the game in, in, in optomechanics, in these nanomechanical resonators, is basically to optimize one of the three figures of merit that exist, force, force sensitivity, mechanical coherence, or quantum correlation of light, okay? And there are different types of resonators. You can have different targets for this. The point I want to make is that we noticed that there, there was actually a region of the space that was not, there was no solution. At least we couldn't find a solution in the literature. Basically, we found three kinds of, of improvements, very, very substantial improvements in, in very high impact uh, work. One was using strain engineering to bring the Q, the quality factor, basically the ratio of stored energy to lost energy. The other one was using phononic crystal designs to isolate the boundaries of, of the resonator. And the other one was using hierarchical structure, but still no one passed 1 billion of, for, for the quality factor Q. This is work that is not, our work is not published yet. These are, of course. So we had a simple idea. We, we thought about, about the problem quite a bit. We also saw evidence that maybe this kind of structure, a bio-inspired design from a spider web could be a, an interesting solution. So we wanted to optimize for this. The problem as usual is that these simulations are very difficult, very, very time consuming. There's very long aspect ratios and you need very tiny little meshes to, to, pr to predict the behavior of the material. So we propose the use of Bayesian optimization. Basically it's Bayesian machine learning, but geared towards optimization. I'll cut the story short, but basically instead of doing regression, you do regression to predict what is the likelihood that you are close to an optimum. 
and then you cluster the points online every iteration around the optimum that you want. We were quite uh, uh, interested in the result because we ran this, this particular spider web and we found out what probably is a different mode of vibration that was not explored in the past, where it vibrates these four beams at the, at the edge and makes, makes it, it isolates the, the resonator from the boundaries. And we are surpassing 1 billion for the Q and we believe it's the first time this is done at low frequencies like we're doing here. To wrap up, there's a lot more to, to, the, to these stories. Machine learning is far from perfect. There's a lot of things that can be developed. Recently, we published a paper about quantum machine learning, so using quantum computers to improve Gaussian processes. These are methods that don't scale very well, Gaussian processes, but are very, very powerful in terms of prediction. And we saw, we showed that actually we can implement this algorithm in a quantum computer, in a quantum circuit, and actually show that uh, in theory, you can get uh, a much more scalable algorithm comparable to neural networks, in fact, surpassing neural networks, bringing the best of both worlds. The accuracy of Gaussian processes are typically more accurate for the same points than neural networks, but the scalability of neural networks that Gaussian processes didn't have. I want to thank you for your time, and uh, I hope I didn't pass too long the 30 minutes, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Miguel. That was a fantastic talk. Um, thank you. We have a, yeah, we have a few questions already in the Q&A, and I'd like to encourage other members of the audience to post questions um, as they come to your mind. So the first question that I'm seeing from the Q&A um, basically says, in the path-dependent problem scenario, so back to the part where you're talking about plasticity, uh, do you feed the, re re um, the RNN with complete loading histories or, on the contrary, employ an internal variable approach? Um, no, no, and no, I no. think it's just uh, yeah, a question. little more detail. Great question, indeed. No, there's no internal variable associated to this. Let me uh, go back to, to you. Um, so literally, it's just the, the history dependency. So what you fit to the network are these strains, the different components. In this case, it was a 2D RVE. So you have three strain components. You could fit in six strain components. You fit in the different histories. This was a little schematic that I had here, right? So you fit in all these histories. And then uh, you, you, you learn, of course, from the stresses. And your goal is for a new strain history to predict the, the stress. And there's a, a, a detail that I would like to point out. We also feed the plastic energy, right? So this is what tells you then, the, the network has to learn two things. What is the deformation? And also what's the accumulation of energy that is in, the, of plastic energy? This tells you that plasticity is starting and the network then can relate what happens to the strains and the stresses and where the nonlinearity comes from. Does this answer your your question? Um, so I guess we don't necessarily have a good mechanism to see if it answers the questions that people post in the chat, but I thought that was a very clear uh, response. That was sorry. helpful. <laughs> yes, okay, we see in the chat. Yes, thank you, Miguel. <laughs> um, so another question um, from the Q&A says, when you're studying computational data, how do you make sure your models are finding kind of quote unquote real results rather than maybe the peculiarities or assumptions of the specific computational design that, that you're using or, or computational model implementation? Yeah, that is very relevant indeed. In fact, and uh, I, I've done, uh, I, have, I want to point out that this accuracy efficiency trade-off is really the, the tricky part. And you are absolutely right. You can have models that are not very accurate. You know, art, artifact, they have artifacts. They're, they're not producing the full physics and so on. And in that case, you may then feed in uh, to the network the, the wrong results, right? And then if you want to generalize this to something new, as you can imagine, garbage in, garbage out. So this trade-off is a really, really tricky thing. and. Uh, Typically, what happens is you, you then increase the computational expense, right, to model complex phenomena. You can be accurate, but now you're not fast enough to get enough data. So this is what actually limits most of the, the, the practical applications of, of methods like this. 
Yeah, great. Um, so another question, uh, I'm guessing it's from somebody who does fluid mechanics, but it says, do you think that similar approaches would make sense to be applied to fluid mechanics as well? Um, like predicting fluid velocity in different channels or confirming results that engineers calculate using Manning's formula for fluid velocity. Indeed, indeed, yes. Uh, and in fact, there are people looking into this as well. Uh, it, 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 I actually think that the fluid mechanics literature started looking into machine learning a little bit sooner than the solid mechanics literature. But it's true that phenomena like turbulent flows and so on, that are also, also associated to chaotic behavior, right? They're not easy to, to predict. Still, there has been good progress. Uh, it's always tricky to point to a particular work, but I, I particularly enjoy the work of Andrew Stewart and, and at Caltech and colleagues and coworkers, where they show that up to a certain time scale, you can still predict the chaotic behavior of, of turbulent flow. But after a while, it kind of, gets already uh, uh, difficult to, to predict. So it's, I think there's still a lot of work there. It's not my specialty, but it's, uh, it's definitely a very interesting field to apply this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, in some ways, the, the fluid mechanics community and solid mechanics community have been working on similar problems, but a bit separately. So it's, it's interesting to hear sort of the references that maybe you look to from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so another question, it says, um, in, in these examples, you're aware of the design space that predicts the response of your structures. So this is going back to the plastic response again. Um, you recognize that you need the deformation history to determine the current state of the structure. Uh, do you have any thoughts or suggestions um, to approach problems where the design space is not well known? So if, if one didn't sort of know all of this beforehand, could an analyst um, learn to use deformation history for a plastic response problem? And Indeed, indeed. I have to confess that we're working very hard on, on that particular problem. And, and there, there has been already some papers uh, by other groups where what you can do is you can now start looking into generative machine learning techniques. Um, I don't know if, how familiar you are with, with the topic, but you can use GANs, Generative Adversarial Neural Networks, or VAEs, Variational Autoencoders, that actually what you do is you're trying to train in a more general sense. They are applied to images, but they can be also applied to mechanics. You have pixels in an image, right? And you train pixels, you actually mix some noise into it. And then the objective of the network is to paint a new picture, if you will. And that picture could be a, a material or a structure as well. And in that case, you don't have to assume or pre-assume any sort of descriptor for the, the, the design. And, and you get uh, the, the solution right away. Of course, this looks a lot more beautiful than it is in actual in practice, because in computer science, people use a lot of data to get these guns and VAEs to work most of the time. So there are some challenges there, but there have been some very, very good works in our field as well. And we'll, we'll put something out as well in the next uh, few months, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and if there are more questions um, to put in the Q&A, um, please, everyone, go ahead. I, I have one question. Um, so on your last two examples with the super compressible material and then um, the new design of the, the resonator, um, there is sort of like an initial sort of seed of human design, right, where you kind of constrain the problem in, in a kind of a, a very informed way. Um, one thing that I'm curious about are sort of um, what are your thoughts on on what it would take to to make skipping that step possible? Right. Yeah, I, I think that we have there's two ways that we could look into this. One way would be, you know, this is just a tool and you still need the expertise of the analysts to to try different designs and you can parameterize it several times and do this also automate that part as well. But in these particular approaches, you would be still constrained to the fact that you have to pre-impose this, right? Which is a, a limitation that is important as well. The other scenario is what is called an inverse design approach based on topology optimization uh, approaches, for example. And now the, these were actually what I was going, was what I, what I was getting into in the previous question you can have these generative machine learning techniques that actually enhance topology optimization, if you will. 
But the difficulty is that so far there has been little improvement, little practical improvement in the context of an inverse design where you don't say anything. The only thing you say is, here's my objective, go, give me the solution, right? There are other difficulties as well. Um, for example, topology optimization is very, very good when you're trying to optimize for stiffness or compliance. But if you have multi-objectives, non-linearities and so on, it can become very difficult because it's, it's, it may not be a, a single optimum, for example, right? You may have difficulties in getting to a global optimum. So I think there's, you know, it's wide open, the, the, the field to actually improve the, uh, that, that particular uh, strategy. Great. Um, and one more question that I'm seeing in the Q&A that's um, either very pragmatic or quite philosophical. Um, it says, how much data is good data? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's, that's a good question, always. So you don't know for, for, uh, as you, when you start, right? It's, it's what I usually say to my students is, you know, imagine that you're fitting a, a 1D function, okay? And if your 1D function is a, is a, is a parabola, Technically, you need two points to, to, to actually find that, that uh, parabola, right? If you actually knew that it was that. But you can, you can understand that actually, you know, three or four points, probably you get a pretty great description with these kind of algorithms already. But now imagine that you have some a, a function, even a 1D function that is much more complicated than that. You will have to have a lot more points to, to sample that. And that's not something that you know a priori. It depends on the complexity of the problem. Just to be clear, there are some strategies, and that's what I was going, getting into here, but I went too quickly, I'm sorry, which is, for example, Bayesian optimization or online learning or reinforcement learning. There are techniques in the machine learning community where actually you start with some points, you know, but then, let's say you started with the, with the uh, red points, but then you keep updating your surrogate model, your regression model, and based on the prediction of the uncertainty, you know, for example, follow this point here, it will restart in a moment. One iteration, you don't know that the real function was there, but soon, you see, soon, as, as you start clustering the points, because that region was, that had a lot of uncertainty in the beginning, then you get closer and closer to the, the regions that matter. Right, so even though you cannot know for, for, for sure how many points you need, you can at least use a technique that is smart in the way that it samples the points, right, online, instead of just pre-sampling and then learning right away, like I was doing in the beginning of, of the talk. I hope this, this, this helps you in your question. Yeah, I, I thought that was a, a great answer. Um, another question coming into the chat um, it says in the super compressible case, only the uncertainties are introduced into the long rounds. Um, so the, the question would be kind of like, how far could you push adding uncertainties in the, into the model? Um, and maybe did, did other uncertainties, um, how, how did you decide that those were or weren't important? So uncertainty maybe in the upper or lower ring design, that sort of a thing. That's right. It's, it's more or less the same logic behind uh, the inverse versus forward approach. In that case, it was a forward propagation of uncertainty. So you can do experiments or you can analyze the structure in the computer and say, okay, what kind of, what's the highest sensitivity for these sort of uncertainties? And then you just propagate it. But you can also do it in an inverse setting. In fact, there is, a, a, in my opinion, a, a beautiful paper by Nicholas Zabaraj in 2018 that actually uses an encoder decoder network, kind of a VAE, but without the variational component of it, to uh, actually uh, get the inverse propagation of the uncertainty, if you will. So automatically propagate and, and keep learning and updating the, the prediction of the uncertainty, which is a, a much more elegant way of, of dealing with that. But that is also possible with, with techniques that, are, that exist today. The problem is that none of them are perfect. You know, those techniques require a lot of data. And in practice, when you actually want to 3D print or have these sort of simulations that help you guide the process, you can't afford to have hundreds of thousands of data points. So it's always a, this, this weird game of, do you want to simplify on the quantification of uncertainty in this case, but you know, use a technique that works well with data scarcity, 
or you know you kind of brute force it in there if you have enough data with these techniques right now you can pretty much do whatever you want you know inverse forward uncertainties no uncertainties history dependency it doesn't really matter wonderful yeah thank you miguel yeah um i think we are on on time to start wrapping up does that sound about right um yeah yep. well thank fun. yeah thank you very much miguel um and thank you to the audience for attending and asking really excellent and just very engaged questions. Um, if you enjoyed today's event, we also encourage you to attend our next distinguished speaker, um, Jacob Bortnick, Professor of Atmospheric and Oceanic Science at the University of California, Los Angeles on Monday, April 26th. And then prior to parting ways, I'd just like to welcome back Eric for closing remarks and thank the Hurry Institute for helping support the organization of this event. Great. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, Miguel. Uh, fantastic presentation, really a, a tour de force of, uh, of uh, everything from machine learning to Bayesian statistics and design to quantum computing, so really fantastic. Um, <clears throat> the video for today, for those of us who would, uh, would like to rewatch it or if you missed it, uh, can be found on our YouTube channel, which I'll put up here for you. Uh, I also want to just thank Emma for hosting today, and I want to thank the junior faculty fellows uh, as their series organizers. Uh, it's been a great series so far. We have a couple more uh, speakers to come, and then Miguel will be back with us on May 3rd. Uh, so I hope you join us then. So thank you all. Thank you.